you go to Ikea and you really want to get this desk, but the desk isn't there. So most companies would say it's sold out, out of stock. And what do you do? You get mad. You're like, oh, darn you, Ikea, because your poor logistics system, I can't have the desk that I want. So what Ikea does is they don't tell you it's sold out. They don't tell you it's out of stock. They say it's oversold. By saying it's oversold, uh, yes. you are placing the blame on the consumer, not the organization. And when you place the blame on the consumer, it looks like the product is more desirable. Right. More want it because oh. the most persuasive thing we could do is show that other people are doing it too. Welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better, where we explore how you can apply insights from visionary leaders and the most provocative philosophers and scientists of our time to make your life and our world a better place. Here's your host, author and speaker, Paul Gibbons. And so, hey, welcome back to Think Bigger, Think Better. I'm your host, Paul Gibbons. And hello, today we have a very exciting podcast with Michael Barbera, who's the CEO and founder of Clicksuasion, and he's an expert in behavioral science. So it should be a very exciting. He's one of these people that's both an expert and really fun to talk to, so I'm really looking forward to getting into that. Um, before uh, we get started, a couple of announcements. If you want to listen to the person who's got the number six TED Talk and most listened to TED Talks of all time, Julian Treasure, a friend of mine, his TED Talk is called How to Speak So People Will Listen. He's also got a number of other TED Talks that have fewer listens, 6 million or 10 million. I think this one has 39 million listens. So he's a spectacular speaker, and he's an expert on sound, especially sound in business, but sound generally also. And he's a fantastic listen. You can find that podcast on Patreon, and uh, it's just really a terrific, terrific listen. Uh, on Think Bigger, Think Better, and also on Patreon, I have uh, Kelly Monahan who's an expert in behavioral science. She works for Deloitte Insights, uh, which is their sort of internal think tank. And she and I had a very fun and, again, very insightful conversation about behavioral science and business, which, as I'm known to say, they're going gaga for it, or behavioral science is the new black. And before that, I had uh, Julie Anderson from Plastic Oceans. And what's really interesting is there in the news again, they have someone swimming around Easter Island and to draw attention to the fact that the oceans are just seething with plastic right now, which is killing off uh, ecosystems, which eventually find their way into our food. Microplastics can find their way into our food, into our rhythms, our streams, our reservoirs. And so this is becoming an issue which uh, I've taken an interest in. You've had some podcasts on it. And also this this trip around Easter Island is very fascinating because it takes a day. And uh, it's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, I think. So, so the currents are non-trivial. Uh, you've got to wait to sort of a perfectly benign day. So anyway, yeah, Julie Anderson, Plastic Oceans, a couple of podcasts ago, really fascinating stuff. Coming up, I have another interview with Charlotte Blank, who's the Chief Behavioral Officer at Merits. She was fascinating and fun and insightful. Uh, I'm interviewing someone who's an expert on change. Her name is Wendy Hirsch. I believe she lives in Florida. And I've been really impressed with her writings on the subject. So I'm looking forward to having her. And I'm going to do a few podcasts on the future of work, how artificial intelligence and robotics are going to affect our workplaces, our workforces, uh, the culture of how we work together, how the structure of jobs is going to change, which jobs are going to be lost, which jobs are going to be gained. So uh, it's something that I pick up in the book Impact, and it's something that I think you're going to be hearing more and more of, if you're not already, uh, in the next couple of years. I've written to uh, a couple of pretty famous people who've gotten back to me. I'm trying to schedule right now Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to talk about the Green New Deal. Uh, she is uh, a, ver a very impressive, a very impressive young member of Congress, I think. She's given a good account of herself in some hearings that have been televised. I thought she was the most mature and credible of a bunch of them. And also General Stanley McChrystal, who's a four-star general in the United States. I want to say Army, but I hope it's not Marines. And... Uh, he was the Allied commander, I believe, in Iraq and Afghanistan, at least one of those, if not both. Anyway, fascinating guy. He's got some great insights on leadership that I've been very impressed with, and so I've also reached out to him. And with luck, he'll be on the show this summer. On a personal front, I've got a title, a cover, and I'm finishing off my new book, Impact. The title has been all over the place. It's going to be called Impact, 
using science to change behaviors, hearts, and minds. It's going to be on behavioral science. It's going to be on influencing. And it's going to be on how to lead change in the digital age and in the future of work. So picking up a couple of those themes that I've been talking about, it's pretty thrilling. I'm sending chapters out to reviewers now. If you want to be one of those reviewers, you know, obviously at one level, you just do me a favor. You know, I never compensate you for the time that, and attention that you would spend to reading a chapter critically, but I'll obviously send you a signed copy of the book and all that kind of stuff once it's done, but most reviewers do it just to do it. So if you're interested, shoot me an email, paul at paulgames.net. Uh, and I'm also looking for someone who's a big name to write a foreword uh, for the book. Tony Say Zappos is on my list. I'm going to reach out to him. Uh, you know, it's going to be someone of that kind of stature. Uh, if you know of someone personally who be interested, then, you know, I'd be interested in hearing from it. So anyway, the book will go on sale about the 1st of April 2019. I will make sure to announce it, of course, here. If you want a free chapter, sign up for my list on paulgibbons.net. And I'm also about the same time going to republish The Science of Organizational Change, which um, my publisher has stopped printing. Uh, <laughs> I just seen on Amazon, the digital copy of it is over $1,000 and the hardback is over 200 So uh, it's, you know, it's basically out of print, but it was always ridiculously priced. Uh, this is just just obscene and absurd. I mean, the Kindle's 44 bucks, but I hope to be able to sell the Kindle for $9.99 once I self-publish it. And so that will also happen this spring. So watch this space. Okay. Now on to Michael Barbera, today's guest. He is an award-winning consumer psychologist and business strategist for Fortune 50 companies, an expert in factors that drive the consumer decision-making process, including behavior, emotion, and experience. His practice include social psychology, decision-making, brand management, marketing, product placement, and long-term growth strategies. He's the CBO, Chief Behavioral Officer. If you don't know what that is, you're going to have to buy my book. At Click Suasion Labs, Michael helps clients to understand consumer influence and consumer behavior online and personally. He's got an impressive list of clients, Boeing, Microsoft, The Washington Post, John Deere, Harley-Davidson, Lynn, Lease, the United States, DOD, United States Department of State. He's worked with colleges, Ithaca College, Purdue, Duke, University of North Carolina, where he lives. So he's a really fun guy and uh, really, uh, again, one of these people who's both expert in his field and really, really fun to talk to. So right now, let's welcome Michael Barrera to Think Bigger, Think Better. So, Mike, welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better. Paul, thanks for having me. This is awesome. I usually start with a really embarrassing question, Mike. Tell us something about yourself that's a little unusual, not on your resume, a hobby or an obsession or something like that. <laughs> well, I can go something embarrassing or I can go something unusual. Maybe a little bit of both. Okay, so unusual, okay. I'm an avid gardener. I enjoy getting my hands. I may not be very good at it, but I did win – Second place uh, at the North Carolina State Fair for canned sweet relish. That is outstanding. You're the first. You're my first canned sweet <laughs> relish guest. <laughs> yes, I am winning. And embarrassing, I once borrowed a friend's backpack for a quick overnight trip on a plane. Uh, I didn't realize there was a knife in the bag, so I didn't check. The TSA security at the airport found it. I was detained and fined $500 for trying to smuggle a weapon aboard an aircraft. Oops. <laughs> yep, yep, big oops. You know what? I yep. learned my lesson. I will check my bag from now on. Well, I'm glad there are no knives on aircrafts. <laughs> and uh, and you're a biker, right? You're a, 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 a Harley guy? or? Well, yes. Yeah, so I own two Harleys. Um, I guess you can say I'm a Harley guy. I love all motorcycles. I do not discriminate. If they have two wheels, I'll, I enjoy them. Yeah, I used, to ride a, I used to ride a Harley in London. But when my child was born, I decided to put that away for he's now 14. So I decided I didn't want to make him homeless or fatherless for that reason. So anyway. Well, four more years, he'll be out of the house and time to get You're back right. on two wheels. <laughs> so I, I, except I made the mistake of having one when I was 50. So, so, so another, <laughs> he's, 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 he's now eight. So uh, maybe another dozen years before I can pick it up. But by that time, I'll be too old for Harley's after I ride a Goldwing. Oh, uh, <laughs> wall. No, take that back. <laughs> no, 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 no. Anyway. So this is Matt. Uh, how come uh, businesses, you know, I first wrote a book on behavioral science uh, 2013 and it was a speculative idea of mine, and now businesses are going crazy for it. So why do you think that has happened? Well, businesses are going crazy for it. I can't say that we're at the place where we need to be or we should be, because I think behavioral science is going to look a lot different a decade from now. About half of the Fortune 500 companies have CBOs. They apply behavioral science in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so right now, it's kind of a want. In five years from now, it's, it's probably going to be a need where majority will have 
um, a chief behavioral officer, or at least a behavioral insights team. Uh, it's a definitely it's a unique way to approach any kind of decision maker, whether it's consumer facing, employee engagement, or something really unique that you may not have heard of before. So, but of those roughly half of the Fortune 500, how many of those behavioral science initiatives are top line focused, and how many are focused on softer things, change, engagement, well being? To say, what's the ratio there? You know, I'm not sure I can give a ratio or a number. I'm just not sure I have the data on that because some are very focused on just employee engagement. Uh, some are very focused only on consumer mm-hmm. engagement. Some are trying to do a little bit of everything and trying to just equally distribute their resources. So mm-hmm. it, it's tough to say, uh, but I think that when you do apply behavioral science to whichever business problem or challenge you have, it should probably be applied to whichever is not maybe needs the most help, but the one that drives your business model. So if you're business model is built on talent, maybe applying behavioral science to employee engagement might be a better approach. There was a, there was an old model, a strategy model, either it's either economic efficiency, customer intimacy, or strategic leadership and innovation. Those were the three different points of the triangle. And I suppose, depending on where your business places its dime, if you will, that's where one of the things you might, you might want to focus on one of those. So yeah, I can, I can see that, but it's, it's birth was in marketing. I mean, most of the early uh, organizational applications, business applications came from the marketing department. Is that is that an, an exaggeration or, or or is that more or less correct? No, that that is correct. So in the 1950s, a a book was written, and it kind of I can't remember the name of the book. It was the persuas the hidden persuaders. And it told all the secrets about how marketing agencies in New York would apply psychology to their practices. Well, people were shocked. People were in awe. There was an uproar about the book. And and then over the years, the public acknowledgement or businesses' acknowledgement, organizational acknowledgement to the application of behavioral science and marketing has significantly decreased. So, for example, today in 2019, if you talk to a behavioral economist or someone who works in behavioral finance – more than likely, they would not acknowledge that they use it for industry purposes or for capital gain. Uh, most want to use it for employee engagement or for solving a social cause. Mm, interesting. Um, a lot of academics do frown upon people applying behavioral science to marketing. However, this debate can go on forever because we know that businesses are in business to make money. Um, they earn revenue. Your revenue goes towards the stock market. It helps your 401k. It's a circle of life that helps everyone out. So businesses will apply it regardless of, of what policies and procedures or regulations get put in place. So it's always going to be that giant elephant in the back of the room. And I say if you have a resource, as long as it's ethical and it's it's, it's legal, go for it. So, so behavioral science, what problems does it solve that? You know, other methods don't. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, the traditional model of behavioral change, what I write about, is that you appeal to hearts and minds. You educate, you persuade, you influence, you cajole, you create a vision, you inspire, you use some of those influence methods. And I guess my always worry about that is it's A, very hard to change people's minds, and B, even if you change your minds, behavior doesn't necessarily track hearts and minds, doesn't track beliefs. So, I guess that's one answer to my, I've answered my own question, but what problems do you think behavioral science is solving that just other methods were, you know, inadequate for solving? Take hurricanes, uh, for example, hurricane evacuations. We have a category category five hurricane coming off or towards the East coast of the United States. You have the representatives or elected officials from North Carolina, Florida, South Carolina, and state of Georgia telling the residents evacuate, evacuate or die. Now you're applying fear, fear fear-based messages. Well, you know what? I've heard this message last year, last hurricane season. This same person told me to leave. And you know what? We had a little bit of rain. I'm not going to leave now. Well, you know what? That that system has has worked in the past, and now it's just the boy who cries wolf. It's it's uh, yeah. we are conditioned to hear the same thing over and over again, so we just start ignoring it. It doesn't no longer apply to us. Yeah. But what if we not change the evacuation message, but change the message of the hurricane? So instead of calling a hurricane Hurricane Michael, I'm not a very scary person, so let's not call a Hurricane Michael. No one's going to evacuate their home because Michael is coming. We have a neighbor named Michael, we have a friend named Michael, and a team member named Michael. But if the hurricane was named Hurricane Hannibal, Hurricane Deathtron 3000, we're just <laughs> reframing the message and you're 
influencing someone to evacuate when you have two options, Hurricane Susie versus Hurricane Deathtron. I'm more than likely going to leave my home and my tangible items behind to save my life if something called Deathtron was approaching in the sky. <laughs> I hear you. It's kind, It's sort of, is it priming? No, it's kind of, uh, I'm thinking about the mind space framework. That's kind of salience i guess that would fall into that category yeah it's it's exactly salience you're you're trying to make something that's intangible tangible yep something that has a dry abstract appeal something that has a little bit of an emotional <laughs> hook to it yeah yeah it's cool so as far as you can see from your vantage point and i know i know this is a kind of a loaded question in our in our world you know the united states if you're most familiar with that what who are the leading firms, as far as you can tell, who are, you know, a few steps ahead of others in applying behavioral sciences in their business? Well, that's a challenging question to, to answer because I don't think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call us a lot. I don't think any of us have it right. I think we're doing really well, but I don't think we know what right is. I don't think we know the right way to apply behavioral science yet. Think of the Internet. You had Internet 1.0 in the late 90s and in, in the first dot-com bubble. Um, that bust. And then we started to find our way. How do we really use the internet? Now we've got smart homes, smart devices, integration, AI. Now we're finally starting to learn how the internet can improve our lives. I think we're still in behavioral science 1.0, maybe 1.3 or 4. We're approaching, we're on our way to 2.0. We're, we're, we're getting our sea legs and trying to figure out how to how behavioral science is really going to improve our lives as it integrates with technology. As for companies that may be ahead of others, that's a, that's a difficult metric to state because how do we measure ahead? I will say a few companies of things that they're working on. So Walmart Labs out of the Bay Area in California, uh, they're doing a lot to get people to, okay, let me back up a little bit. Problem, a common problem that Walmart has is people will accept the position as an employee there. Come start day, they will not show up. Why would someone accept the position at Walmart but then not show up the very first day? Okay, so there's biases, there's perceptions, there's um, stigma. What, how can we change that? So that's one challenge. So they're applying that to employee decision-making or candidate decision-making at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have organizations. Uh, I don't want to say their name, but they're out of the Bay Area also. They're a tech company. And they came to us and said, hey, we want to take, um, you know, those BuzzFeed quizzes where you could, yeah. you take this quiz and we'll tell you, we'll tell you which friend which, character which, you are. Which Star Wars character. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, right. So yeah, they yeah, say, hey, yeah. can you take that and then apply our employee engagement data with the new product information so we can kind of train our employees in a gamification BuzzFeed quiz and yeah. uh, had us take a step back. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I'm not sure this is something we can handle. Um, <laughs> Just because it's, it, it sounded taxing, I, it, I wasn't confident that we could do it. So I said, let me think about it, and let me regroup with, with our team here and see what we can do. So everyone on the team is saying, Mike, we can do this. We got this. I'm like, okay, I, I, I trust all of you. Don't make us look bad. So, you know, we did it, and um, it's probably one of the most fun, oh, coolest, and engaging products we've ever made, uh, and I would totally yeah. do it again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, those things are a lot of fun. I found out I was a Jesse Pinkman in Breaking Bad. Uh, it's a little disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> or Badger. I can't remember which one. Maybe I was Badger. It was even worse. Um, yeah, very, 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 very good. So uh, you've said that this reach really reaches across all functions, operation management, you know, finance, uh, human resources, certainly, and certainly marketing and sales. Is that right? So really, there's not a function in business that is untouched by the potential of behavioral sciences. Is that, that right? I'm sure there is somewhere. Um, uh, I'm I suppose. Sure there, there's yeah. got to be that, that, yeah, that, that exaggeration. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, you know, like I said, we, we don't have it perfect. We, we can, we can predict, we can, we can get close to predictions. So we can't, we're not, we're not perfect. Right. So let me ask you this. Um, you know, there are however many million knowledge workers in the United States, it's in the tens of millions or something like that. What does the non-specialist manager need to understand? Someone who's not setting out to be a behavioral science specialist, someone you know whose main job will be thinking about how to apply behavioral science in their business. What general knowledge do people need, and and where can they get that these days? I don't think we really need knowledge. I think we need the ability to self-reflect. Uh -huh. um, if we self-reflect on our own decisions our own decision-making process, we were at that point researching behavioral science, decision science. 
So one of the one of the problems that behavioral science has is that we take all this great knowledge, we mm. stuff it into an academic journal, which the average practitioner is not likely to access, not likely to read, and not likely to understand because uh, most practitioners don't understand APA style or APA format statistics. It's just not approachable. So yeah. a, uh, a very famous researcher, Robert Cialdini, once said, behavioral science is um, a business without a shipping department. No, BS, we are that shipping department. Um, <laughs> because what happens is, so researchers research some awesome stuff. The researcher grows through their career. A decade later, they now become a prominent researcher. That researcher's name is all across their field. Then they write a book. They're writing a book on 10-year-old data. That book goes out to practitioners, and now practitioners are applying 10-year-old science. So how can we change how people approach it? Well, there are some resources that do apply behavioral science in a, a format that is not made for other academics. There's the Behavioral Scientist magazine. Any newly published book on behavioral, you're like, yours, you have a book coming out on, on behavioral Thank science. You. Read your book. Yes. Thank you. I'm coming soon to find bookstores near you. Yes, yes, yes. Here, here's my fingers pointing at the microphone. Buy Paul's book. <laughs> <laughs> Here at our lab, um, we have a deck of cards called the Fundraising Action Pack. And what this is, it's, it's a deck of 50 cards. 46 cards have behavioral principles on it, and four cards have instructions. And on each card, you have examples of how that behavioral principle or that construct was applied to fundraising. You have um, reflective questions so you can reflect on your prior business decisions. And then you also have um, an application section of how you can apply this construct to Fundraising, how can you apply anchoring? How can you apply the decoy effect? How can you apply uh, conditioning, et cetera, to fundraising? So uh, ways like that that are that are constructed in um, any kind of format or vernacular that the average practitioner can access. So I would say stay away from the journals unless that's your thing and find where the researchers publish in non-academic journals. So you're actually, one of the things I talk about in my book is gamification, and you've talked about it more than once here. So actually, it's funny, your product is an example of you gamifying uh, education and awareness of behavioral science. That's really awesome. That's a nice. That's a nice piece of work, by the way. A nice piece of intellectual property. Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, gamification is 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 fun because uh, a few weeks ago, uh, one of our one of our clients came to us and said, "Hey, we need to launch a survey because we want to launch another version of this product, but we want to change to color. So we we want to know which color the our audience wants." Well, we know what happens when we get an email that says, take a survey, win an Amazon gift card, 30 seconds, take a survey. We're just going to click right through it. We're not even going to take it. Now, if you reframe that message and say, here's a poll, you get to vote on which color the next version is. Ooh, okay, I'm in. Blue, green, purple, red. Now I have buy-in. And now that I have buy-in to it, I'm more than likely to buy it. Even though, even if my color was not chosen or did not win the poll, you're increasing engagement to your survey because you didn't call it a survey. You made it a game. You made it a poll. And you reframed it. And you bought, and you had buy-in. So now that individual, that customer, potential customer, believes that they have a, a personal bond or connection or say in the direction of that business. Let me ask you a question. Uh, no, I absolutely not. Your 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 card deck is that a standalone product that people can purchase, or is it part of your training package? Is part of one of your tools in in your behavioral science education programs? Both, both. Uh, so if you go to clicksuasion dot com forward slash cards, you can access the cards. Uh, right now, the version one is up. It's a very limited run. Only a hundred decks. There's a few remaining. I grab them now before a version two comes out with the packaging involved, and the packaging is going to be designed so it can sit on your desk, and you can kind of actually. The packaging is kind of gamified where you can engage with them on the desk and then the, um, that'll be version two here shortly. You've just used CLDN scarcity. Can you believe it? Yes. <laughs> See, it's so part of your DNA, right? It is part of my I, I, behavioral I, sites, right? There it is right there. It's stuck with me. <laughs> a scarcity where? is one of my favorite um, one of my favorite behavioral constructs. Um, buy, now, buy now while supplies last. Yes. And then you take scarcity and then you have time pressure and you make time scarcity. One of my favorites because I think that the deadline is one of the greatest inventions. If you'll permit me a 10-second commercial break, Think Bigger, Think Better survives only because of the goodwill and support of its Patreon subscribers. So if you're loving the show, head over to patreon.com Paul Gibbons and hit that Become a Patron button. For as little as $2 a month, you get extra content, free content, can listen into recordings, and get free books. So thank you very much for your support, and back to our show. Where 
are consumers, say I'm a consumer, I'm not necessarily a business person or something like that, where are people seeing behavioral science already in their day-to-day lives? Where, where are they seeing uses of it? Because, you know, we're often, we don't know what's going on under the hood when we see advertisements or product placements or anything like that. So where, where are we seeing that in our lives? We see it everywhere. And the reason why we don't know it's there is because it's working. If you are a non-behavioral scientist or you don't understand behavioral science and you see it in action, it's being yeah. applied the wrong way. It's being app- probably applied too overtly, too persuasive, and it's likely yeah. to go awry. If you watch a St. Jude's commercial for donations, uh, yeah. in the very back of the commercial, kind of blurred out, there's a number. As you'll, so you'll see one of the children in a wheelchair and they'll be talking to you. But very back in the blur, you'll see a, a whiteboard with the number 49 written on it. What is that 49 doing? Anchoring you into increasing Anchoring. your donation amount. Very good. You go to Ikea and you really want to get this desk, but the desk isn't there. So most companies would say it's sold out, out of stock. And what do you do? You get mad. You're like, oh, darn you, Ikea, because your poor logistics system I can't have the desk that I want. So what Ikea does is they don't tell you it's sold out. They don't tell you it's out of stock. They say it's oversold. By saying it's oversold, uh, yes. you are placing the blame on the consumer, not the organization. And when you place the blame on the consumer, it looks like the product is more desirable. Right. More people want it because oh. the most persuasive thing we could do is show that other people are doing it too. That's such a such a great reframe. That it's such a great reframe. It's not that it's not that we're out of stock. It's that this is damn hot. That's and, right. And boy, we you have use that. and boy, that's you have good taste. <laughs> Excellent taste, sir. Yeah, that's really that's really cool. You know, now that I'm of course studied this, I see it everywhere I go. You know, magazine subscriptions are my favorite, right? If you go in, there's three different things. There's print, there's digital, and there's digital as print. I probably have 40 magazine subscriptions or something like that. And there's always a decoy and an anchor, right? There's always one that's really stupidly expensive. And then right next to the one that's a few dollars more is one that's loaded with features, which is the one that they want to make, which has got the biggest margin on it. Or there's a decoy or there's an anchor or something like that. I see that everywhere now. The, the uh, decoy but, effect is phenomenal because uh, if you structure it right, you can offer an additional product or service to the consumer um, without increasing your cost of goods sold. And what you're doing is you're also increasing engagement or you're giving the consumer the perception that they had a win. Yeah, or, or, or print. There's print price and there's a digital price and print plus digital, which you really want to do because it's the highest price point, looks insanely cheap relative to the other two. Right. And digital costs nothing to use and you're going to engage with it more. Now you get a notification on your phone, on your yeah. tablet, and you, oh, I'll click that. And now it's more engagement. That's more ad revenue for, um, for that organization. And, and how much work do you get asked to do anything in the – because email marketers have been – you know, there's probably more ink spilled on the internet on email marketing than almost anything else right now. It's probably overtaken porn. But um, do you get asked? <laughs> do you, get, you get asked to do much in email marketing? Is that is that something you also advise on? The majority of work we do in email marketing is with eye tracking. So we would put yeah. the um, the participant in front of a computer screen. We'll put some great old eye tracking glasses on them, and then we would have them uh, engage with the emails, and we would analyze the data, and then more more than likely advise the the um, the client on where to place certain text what's distracting that consumer, and how to format their emails. You know, one of the things I assert, and I just want to double check it with you, is that there's a a, a really a different mindset that people need to have in order to make maximum use of that. And I think a lot in organizations, people are really hungry from the recipe book. These are the three steps, or these are the eight steps, or these are the two boxes, or, or whatever. And this ain't like that, is it? It, you know, I don't think it is. Uh, I think we're just scratching the surface with a good table of contents. We have a nice outline, and, and we're getting there. And there are some organizations that are applying behavioral science in phenomenal ways. But when we look back 10 years from now and say, wow, we did that 10 years ago, this has completely changed. I, I think for most people, the barrier will be kind of you need an experimental mindset. Like you don't really know. Like the whole thing in internet marketing is like A-B testing or split testing or something like that is that you don't do a big bang recipe book type implementation, you tinker, you try things out, you experiment, you measure results. You have has hypothesis. You're what you are. You're, you're a little scientist trying to figure out what's going to work and what's going to produce the behavioral response you want. Uh, At least that's the way I see it. I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I defer to your expertise. How do you see it? Oh, you're absolutely right. So a lot of people are likely to make 
decisions based on intuition, like, okay, you know what, that that font looks pretty good, or this copy looks okay here in this email. When you break it down a little further, you can A-B test. And then you have a large segment of practitioners who would A-B test and, and test it out. But then where a lot of practitioners go wrong in their A-B testing, although they are, you know, many scientists and they're, and, and, and they're doing it with good intent, a lot of practitioners, what they do is they will make too many changes in those A-B tests. So instead of testing oh, one change here and there, now you're changing several variables. And now you don't have a way to measure which variable is effective. They don't really have a control group. And, and there's interesting, I mean, you know, be, uh, we don't really teach people, uh, certainly not in business school and sometimes not even in science education, is, you know, how to experiment, how to create a control group. And the sort of mindset that comes with, you know, tinkering and, and figuring out what things work. Because as you say, so eloquently, you know, it's early days for us. You know, we're still at uh, version 1.2 or 1.3. You know, if you want to be on the leading edge of this, you're going to have to take some risks and you're going to have to experiment, I would say. You triggered a thought for myself back in elementary school. So elementary school, when we had the, the science fairs and you would get your poster board out and you would write out, well, what's your hypothesis? Um, what's your conclusion? And I would be thinking like, this is a lot of fun, but I'm never going to use this. What would I need this for in real life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's wrap up with one more question. So chief behavioral officers, you offer uh, through ClickSuasion CBO services. You know, what is a CBO? I mean, look, it varies from the 250 of them in the Fortune 500. So they'll be doing a lot of different things. But archetypally, what, is a, what does a CBO do? At 35,000 feet, a CBO is likely to advise um, the C-suite on decisions that involve behavioral science. And that can be on any part of, of business. So, for example, if you have a, a board meeting on eight different topics, well, the CBO is likely to review data and, and give their input and advice on their outlook of the situation using behavioral science. Sure. And, and so when... When advising or looking at other companies, it really doesn't matter what part of the company is, whether it's consumer insights, whether it's employee engagement or something completely different or new. It's, it's having an objective lens on how people make decisions, how people act, decide, think and engage with whatever you're trying to want them to do. Excellent. Excellent. And what skills does your archetypal CBO need then? A, a CBO should be tra formally trained in behavioral science. I will say this. So we, we have we have PhDs here. There's a lot of PhDs in behavioral science. I have to say a PhD is, is not required. Uh, you can be extremely knowledgeable on a topic without having a PhD. Uh, I think uh, I think there's some really good behavioral scientists out there that have master's levels degrees and a lot of industry experience that can apply it. I also think they need business skills. You know, it's not enough to be academic. I mean, someone's using Dan Ariely. I mean, he's just a generally smart cookie. So I think you put him anywhere, he's going to be able to add value. But I think they also need to know, understand the business context. You know, I think understanding the industry context, understanding how a little bit how retail works. Oh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. When you walk into a retail, a brick and mortar retail store, there's behavioral science everywhere you look. It may be right. It may be wrong. It may be OK, um, but it, it, it's there. It is being applied. So when you walk into a store, most people walk into the right hand side. Well, what are you going to put there? Um, which items are you going to place in which locations? Um, when you go to a grocery store 10 years ago, when you went to a grocery store, when you get to the checkout lane, um, you would have the candy bar rack and there'd be a flat top on top of that candy bar rack. When you're in a grocery store, if you're deciding, you know what, I'm not going to make a, um, a purchase today. I'm not going to buy this box of cereal. When you make that decision to not buy something, you're in the checkout line. So you take that box of cereal or that gallon of milk and you place it on top of the candy rack. Well, now if you go to a grocery store, at least in the U.S., most will have A-frames. So that top of that <laughs> candy rack is the check. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you already see it. So you can't actually put something down on there. And how likely are you to place a gallon of milk on the floor if people are standing behind you? So at that point, you're more likely to buy that gallon of milk. So really rough math, really subjective math. If a gallon of milk costs three three dollars and you have 20 checkout lanes that are open 24 hours a day that's three dollars per hour per lane that's a lot of revenue it's behavioral insane. science in action just by the shape or design of the of, of the uh, the candy bar rack and that's one of the miracle things with it is sometimes very small changes can create 
really big results. And that's the interesting thing, I think, about behavioral science that we're still learning. Yeah, you don't have to change the world. You just need to know how your consumers think. If, if you have consumers engaging with your services or your products, you can reframe or revise how you structure it or how you approach it or how people engage with it. It won't solve every problem, but it will definitely help in, in the little things. Um, and sometimes maybe changing a um, changing a, a candy bar rack from a square to an A-frame with a point on top, it may cost a significant amount of money up front, but what is the investment for the future? And, and there are some that just don't pan out to be good investments. I've been to a couple of presentations of behavioral science and I hear some really intelligent people say, pitch or present ways that retail can change their structure. Well, I'm thinking like, that's really cool. If I was a consumer, I would definitely engage with that. I love it. Then I start thinking of the math. Okay, the math, the math, the math. Okay. And, and mathematically, economically, it's not going to work. And that company would likely fail because um, so the numbers don't check out. So not every behavioral science solution is a win, uh, but we can structure it so it's both a win for the consumer and a win for the company financially. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about grocery stores as you were telling that story. I asked someone once, some, you know, talking about losing weight and how to, you know, make good food choices and everything. Like that. He says, I got one tip for you. Stay out of the middle of the store. I said, what do you mean by that? <laughs> he says, all the high margin and all the shitty products, you know, all the processed foods are all in the middle of the store. And if you want to find fresh stuff, where's that? You got to walk through all of the aisles of Doritos in order to get to, you know, the spinach and arugula salad or whatever, exactly. which, I thought, which I thought was interesting. I thought, it was, and the most shop for items like a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread, they're all the way at the back because you got to walk all the way through all this, all the cakes and the cookies and the, the sodas and whatever. So I thought that was a very interesting insight. They're not dumb. They've been thinking about this for a long time. Yeah, grocery stores, gro grocery stores and casinos are phenomenal at applying behavioral science. When you walk into a, a decent grocery store, the first thing you're going to see is likely to be flowers. Flowers are the freshest thing on this planet. Mm. If you see fresh flowers, you're, they're priming you to believe that everything else beyond those flowers is fresh. And then you look at casinos, no windows, no outside distractors. Yeah, uh, you don't know. Oxygen. You don't yeah. know if it's you don't know if it's five o'clock in the morning or whatever, right? You don't even yeah. Sunday or Saturday. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, I spent I play poker, so I spent a lot of time in casinos. So yeah, that's kind of funny. People always ask me, "What was the weather like in Vegas?" I say, "How would I know?" <laughs> you know, it's been great talking to you. So, where can people find you uh, on on the web? You know, where 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 can they go? How can they? You know, what can, how can you hook them up? What's what What's the story there? Okay. So the first way to find me is you can just plain and simple Google me, Michael Barbera. There's also my personal website is michaelbarbera.com. I am the chief behavioral officer at Click Suasion Labs, C-L-I-C-K-S-U-A-S-I-O-N.com. Uh, come engage, connect with me on LinkedIn. I will respond back. I love networking. I love engaging. I will get on a phone call. I will get on a video chat and I'll harass you as long as you want to harass me. <laughs> Look, I'm super grateful. I'm really grateful. And, and I hope actually uh, I've got a, a, ch a book chapter on behavioral science. And, you know, I might I, you might be very grateful if you take a look at it with your expert expert eyes. I might I might send it your way. So but hey, mostly thank you for being on Think Bigger, Think Better. It's uh, it's been really great to have you really insightful. Paul, the pleasure is absolutely mine. And that was great. Michael was certainly a ton of fun. And thanks a lot for listening. It's always fun for me to talk to leading thinkers who are also, you know, don't take themselves too seriously or a lot of fun to talk to or engaging. So I hope you enjoyed it. And we also had Michael's an expert on pickled relish. So, so there's that. We haven't had one of those on Think Bigger, Think Better before. I am 100% absorbed in writing right now. I'm between the kids and writing and a bit of gym and a bit of chill time and a bit of playing League of Legends here and there. There isn't much of me left. I find when I'm writing, my head, even while sleeping, is buzzing with ideas. So sometimes I get up at 2 a.m. and write for a few hours and then go back to bed and crash. And it's a wild ride. I mean, I truly love it, but it's hard to make writing and podcasting pay, even though my change book's been a bestseller since it was launched. That's why I'm particularly grateful to people who support the podcast on Patreon. It costs about a grand a month to run, and it's really done out of love. I mean, they're fascinating topics. They're important people. They're important issues, I think. If two or five bucks a month isn't too much, hop on over to Patreon and hit that subscribe button. It'll be deeply grateful. And there are tons of goodies, although a lot of people don't do it for that reason. They do it just to contribute and make a difference to something they think is valuable that they enjoy. Uh, the little bit of pop culture I'm into right now, while well, I watch Captain Marvel, a driven, passionate Earth girl captured by aliens and turned into a superpowered badass. I yeah, it was a ton of fun. I'm rewatching Breaking Bad and waiting for Thrones and Stranger Things to resurface. I have a teenager. 
and all we listen to is rap. He gets to own the uh, stereo in their car. Have you ever fought with your teenager over the car stereo? But anyway, he and I happen to like the same kind of music. So we're listening to 21 Savage and Juice World and Post Malone and the Migos. And it's a ton of fun. It makes me feel like I'm 14 again. But except when I was 14, it was the Ohio Players. It was the OJs. It was McFadden and Whitehead. It was Teddy Pendergrass. So uh, yes, I'm that old. The early 1970s. Anyway, thanks for listening today. Thanks for all your support. And I will talk to you in a few weeks. To celebrate the launch of the show, and thank you all for listening, I'm going to be giving away books. Lots and lots of books. All you have to do is leave a review in iTunes. We're going to raffle off a book every single week for 12 weeks. So head on over to paulgibbons.net slash iTunes to get easy-to-follow directions and let me know the title of your review to make sure that you're entered to win. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Think Bigger, Think Better. Great ideas are great, but this isn't gospel. Share your critical thinking in the comments. Where do I disagree? What insights were most powerful? If you got value, don't forget to share the value by sharing the podcast. Finally, to get information on book and blog releases and new video content, head over to paulgibbons.net and join the community of thinkers talking about using science and philosophy to make our world a better place. Thank you.